a, a real treat, not just because I'm, I'm seeing many of these folks for the first time in about a year, um, but uh, also uh, you know, having Dr. Loomis uh, with us. Dr. Loomis hired me as an adjunct many years ago, and uh, he's always a great inspiration uh, for me and, and a great resource. So this is a real treat. Um, we've never done this before, so we, we've done some kind of um, inter-class stuff uh, via discussion board, but we've never actually done like a live uh, thing like this uh, for G2 classes, so uh, this is exciting. Um, so I, what we're going to do is I'm going to take the sort of the first part uh, of the program. Uh, I have a PowerPoint here that uh, I've prepared for you. Uh, some of the um, some of the folks that were in OSL 500 uh, may see a couple of familiar slides, but there's, there's a whole ton of new material in here. And um, then uh, we're going to be sure to take a break about 7:30. So those of you who need to get down to the um, to the little calf, uh, you know, can get uh, you know refreshments and that sort of thing. And then uh, Dr. Loomis and um, Dr. Paul will be uh, you know uh, taking on various uh, points. So uh, so again, thank you all for being here. This is a real treat. I'm so happy to see so many of you, and um, definitely looking forward to this. Um, so a little bit of a house cleaning, cleaning sort of thing. Fred, is my audio uh, okay? Okay. Um, that's not a very good picture of me, uh, as you can see. <laughs> but uh, so basically, you know, talking about issues of, of you know race and ethnicity and society are, are always very difficult and they're very challenging. You know, each of us kind of comes to our uh, perceptions and beliefs um, and biases oftentimes uh, from different roots. Uh, sometimes they may be, you know, uh, founded on real life experiences. Other times it can be misinformation or whatever. So it's a challenging topic to talk about. So I want basically everybody to feel safe. You know, like we learned in, in, in the sandbox, let's all just, you know, be courteous and polite to each other and, and respectful. Um, you know, we don't have to agree on, on, on everything. Um, you know, what uh, I'm trying to show you tonight is it's sort of a big picture, kind of. Um, so there'll be some history, there'll be some anthropology, there'll be some sociology, there'll be some, uh, uh, you know, some statistics and, and, and lots of other things. Um, but um, the other thing that I, uh, so, so again, this is a learning lab. So, you know, let's not worry too much about, you know, phrasing things exactly uh, 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 the right way. Uh, you know, we're all, we're all adults. Um, but the one thing that I'd like to leave with you is after we get done tonight, uh, I think this will be a, a really very interesting and informative uh, uh, session, um, what are you going to do next? What are you going to do next? And it kind of fits in with, with the topic of the course, social and ethical responsibility of leadership. <clears throat> so how many races are there? Oftentimes I'll, I'll ask this uh, if I'm teaching an undergraduate course. People say, oh, well, there's three, oh, there's five. No, there's only one race, the human race, homo sapiens sapiens. That, that, that's who we, we are. Um, and that's incredibly important because we really are all members of one human family. And I think if we can look at race, issues of race and ethnicity and bias that way, it kind of changes the, the, the landscape uh, just a little bit. So um, all ancient and modern uh, humans uh, originated in Africa. So, you know, we're all basically Africans. <laughs> you want to look at it that way. Uh, you know, um, there were, before we arrived, the Homo sapiens sapiens. Um, uh, before that, there were, you know, the Neanderthals, uh, Australopithecus. Uh, there were there was a group of little, uh, they're called hobbit people. There, there are other hominids. There are all other, you know, human-like people that basically descended from the apes. But, but we're, we're the last um, uh, on, on the scene. So um, the, the uh, original migration out of Africa started about four million years ago. That's when the first kind of more human-like type hominid, uh, you know, really, uh, really began to evolve. And then modern Homo sapiens uh, migrated out, out of Africa about 70,000 years ago. And you can see, um, oh, look at this is the next slide. Um, you'll see on the next slide the, the migratory pattern. So what is race? <clears throat> there is no such thing as race. There is no scientific foundation for the concept of race. Race is a social construct, which means it was invented. Um, so there is no race. There's only one human race. Um, so th there are no races, but there are climes. And so what a climb is, is basically, if you think about, um, so a person comes from Africa, or a person comes from Israel, or a person comes from Palestine. Um, if people from that area look similar, it's because basically at some point way back, they're related. They have some common ancestors. So that's what a climb is. So, so you know, we come, from, we come from certain environments. We come from certain gene pools, you know, things like that. 
but the, but the, this idea of race, uh, you know, it, 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 it does not really exist uh, in, in science. Um, so why do people look different? Well, those are called phenotypes. So hair, eyes, skin color, uh, things of that nature. Um, th those are, you know, less than 1.1 percent, less than 0.0 uh, percent, 1 percent. Uh, so human beings, regardless of how they look, are 99.9 percent .9 identical, or let's say similar, not necessarily identical, because you do have different genes. Um, our, our differences between us and our chimpanzees are closest. So, you know, again, hu human beings are, you know, very, very closely uh, related. So what does ethnicity mean? So, so if race doesn't, as, as a term, uh, scientific term doesn't really exist, uh, what does ethnicity mean? So ethnicity is actually a little more accurate way of talking about these issues, of identifying people in, in various groups. So eth ethnicity basically relate, relates to where did you come from? Where do your people come from? Where, where did your ancestors come from? So it's, it's those places of origin. It's really a, a somewhat more accurate uh, way of um, uh, defining uh, uh, this issue as opposed to, to race. So what is ethnocentrism? So ethnocentrism is our particular perspective. So you know, like there's there's a worldview. People have worldviews in different ways, but based on how we grew up and, and our personal experiences and things that we learned and things that our, our families and, and, our, and our peer groups and things uh, you know that we learn from them, we have this certain idea. So um, at one time, back uh, like in the the late 1800s, uh, there was this idea of well, races were ranked sort of various levels. So you know, there was whites and then there may have been Asians and then brown people and then Blacks on the bottom, that, that, that sort of thing. Um, so ethnocentrism means what I know, what I experience, what I learn. But that's not necessarily the entire picture. So sometimes what we learn is wrong. Sometimes what we learn is right. Uh, sometimes it might be a little bit of both. But we should remember, um, so if I'm standing here on this side of the room, I'm seeing a certain picture. You all can't see exactly what I see. So if I tell you, you know, I see this many people sitting here, that sort of thing, I'm, I'm looking at this many people, and you say, well, yeah, but I'm sitting over here, and I'm only seeing one person in a, in a black sweater talking. Okay, that, that's kind of an analogy. So what you're seeing is based on your, your perceptions, based on your experiences, based on your knowledge. Um, so, so that doesn't mean that you're right or I'm wrong. I mean, we're, we're both right in, in, in that sense. But it, it's about perspective, about where we're standing. You know, that, that, that's incredibly important. So this is uh, the, the migration uh, pattern, and uh, this is you know pretty much more or less uh, you know uh, with, with scientists uh, agree on we're always discovering new things. So um, you know even science, which is kind of the, the gold standard of, of information and knowledge, it's only based on what we know today. So you know one time uh, in, in, in history, people thought the world was flat. Um, Kyrie Irving, the NBA player, <laughs> still thinks it is. He's wrong. I'm sorry. <laughs> you know a guy that makes his living with a round ball. But he thinks the world is flat. You know, doesn't make a lot of sense to me. But you know, if that works for him. Um, so as you can see, I mean, there, there's incredible migration. Um, you know, out of Africa. Uh, you know, uh, and eventually the, the New World, uh, calling New World the Americas, uh, was, was last. Um, and even this is, can be a little bit more redefined. You know, as you know, um, the idea of that Christopher Columbus discovered America is totally not true. He never even got to America. He got to the Bahamas. That's the closest he ever got. Um, the Vikings actually were here in the year 1000. Uh, so, um, and there, there are probably other, um, uh, you know, uh, European sailors um, uh, that came as well. Uh, there's some decent evidence that uh, Chinese explorers made it to the West Coast, like around, you know, San Francisco, Southern California, uh, back prior to, to Columbus. Um, and uh, Tor Heyerdahl was, was a famous um, a Danish explorer, and uh, he did a couple of tests. Uh, and so he built this raft, um, this raft called the Contiki, and he sailed from West Africa to the Americas. He, he managed to get to the Caribbean uh, on a raft. So ancient peoples, you know, we, we tend to think of them, yeah, they're, they're, they weren't very smart, you know, um, but they were incredibly smart. I mean, to be able to do this, to travel this way around the world without cars or airplanes or, you know, uh, you know GPS, that's astonishing. Okay. So uh, on, the, on the top right there, that's a picture of our earliest known ancestor. Before it was, it was a, a hominid called Lucy. Uh, but this um, uh, already is actually a little bit older than Lucy. Lucy was about four million years old, and her, her skeleton has been uh, traveling around the world on, on display. Um, but this, this is a female hominid. Uh, it was about four feet tall, uh, 110 pounds, discovered in Ethiopia by, by a college student. So 
basically a theory is, as you probably know, the apes came down out of the trees. Um, you know, they kind of got into this foraging thing in grassland uh, because that was really dangerous because they were lying to tigers. So they started standing upright so they could see over the grass. So they could see if somebody you know, was going to come into the grass. And, and that's how that bipedalism uh, started. Um, this was a, uh, not a recent discovery, but it's a re recent uh, pre- um, So um, this is Cheddar Man, and I love cheddar cheese. Um, so Cheddar Man, you know, w was uh, discovered in 1903, but they did this scientific recreation of what he must have looked like uh, just recently, just this year, and this is probably what he looked like: dark brown skin and blue eyes. Like you wouldn't think of ancient Britons as looking like that, but that's how they look. You know, that's, that's how they look. He looks like a friendly guy. Okay, <clears throat> so I had a DNA test. And this is my uh, breakdown. It, it actually breaks down even farther than this. But th th these are the major areas. So as you can see, uh, my European ancestry is 53%. My African ancestry is 46%. The biggest parts of, of each of those is Irish and Nigerian, almost equal to about 25%. And then it falls down from there. Um, you know, I, ha I have a, an ancestor who was from the West Indies, um, largely Danish ancestry. Uh, so that's where the 11% the Scandinavian comes in. But, um, but, but I show this to show that, so these ideas of like race and ethnicity, they're way more complicated than we think about. So we, so we can't really think in terms of black or white. Um, virtually everybody on the planet is, is mixed in, in some way or another. Uh, so this is, you know, uh, if you had yours done, it would probably be, you know, um, similarly, um, you know, very detailed and, and very complex. So this is an interesting thing with these DNA tests, um, that um, in 2014, uh, 23 and me they're one of the big uh, DNA uh, testing things. Uh, Ancestry.com is another one. So they did this survey of about 50 to 100 people. Um, 3.5 percent of the 148,789 people who, who identified as European actually had one percent or more of African ancestry. So this is an article this woman talked about you know she had no idea. She grew up white or she always thought her family was entirely white. She had no idea she had an African ancestor. So um, the other thing that's, that's it's kind of a phenomenon uh, these days, uh, spurred uh, on, I think, often by, by the, this DNA testing, is people are seeing how much more complex they are. So even on the census, like way back when on the census, um, uh, you know, I checked multiple boxes, even though like you weren't allowed to do that at the time. But eventually, apparently so did other people. So you, there are more, more oppor not opportunities, options in terms of checking, you know, what, what are you exactly? Because I identify myself as mixed because I, I'm pretty mixed, as, uh, as you can see. Um, so that's another thing that's kind of a really interesting uh, that, that's developing. So <clears throat> a couple of slides here. How, how does race impact society? We all have biases. Uh, it's basically because, you know, we grew up at a particular time, at a particular place, uh, with a particular uh, type of education, uh, with particular, you know, kind of prevailing attitudes from our parents or grandparents, that sort of thing. So, so we all have biases. And, and, you know, th th that's okay as long as we're aware of that and we can learn from that and, and, and improve uh, upon our thinking. And again, you know, based on beliefs, um, you know, misconceptions, uh, fears, ignorance. Um, ignorance basically being, meaning lack of information, lack of knowledge, observation, um, things that have happened to us, the way we were educated. Uh, it can be based on a lot of things. Um, so enculturation is about, you know, how we grew up, how we learned this whole body of culture knowledge that, that we have, that, that we grew up uh, with. Um, contact with or isolation from others can also lead to, to biases. Um, there was a study, uh, uh, a dear friend of mine who has since passed away did a study on when do boys begin to develop um, chauvinistic ideas? You know, uh, you know, is that something that's just like ingrained in, in all males or is that something that they learn? And so what she found from, from studying um, uh, daycare programs and Rose Valley School was, was one of them, was that when boys are exposed to girls in social settings, educational settings, at an early age, they tend not to have those types of, you know, kind of hardcore chauvinistic ideas that many uh, other males. So, uh, so, so those males who do not go to you know, nursery school or, or have female relatives or have close interaction with uh, girls, uh, you know, at, at that age, uh, childhood, they tend to develop these more chauvinistic attitudes. So, you know, that's enculturation. That's a part of the, the, the culture they're growing up with. 
and they're, they're learning. Um, so, you know, be, being exposed to people who are different from us is generally almost always good. Uh, not being exposed to people who are different than us can, can give us a limited understanding, limited knowledge. Uh, language is a vehicle that, you know, carries everything, that carries, you know, how we learn, what we learn, the way we learn about others. Um, but even though, as I said earlier, there's no such thing as race, race does impact society in, in a number of really uh, critical ways. One way uh, race impacts us is in terms of quality of life uh, factors. So um, as you can see here, black Americans expect, can expect to live uh, till about age 76. White Americans are likely to live to age 79 on average. Um, where you live determines uh, your health. Uh, That's the name of, of a study done by the CDC. Um, educational attainment can be very different. As you see, you know, going down uh, below uh, high school, uh, the, there's a divergence there. Uh, the high school areas are pretty, pretty close. Uh, some college, um, the associate's level, but then as it goes on, as you can say, white educational attainment is greater. You know, and, and why is that? Uh, one reason may be the types of resources and schools that are available in your area. So if you go to a school that's not a very good school, meaning they don't have really skilled or experienced teachers. They don't have a lot of good learning resources. They don't have access to technology or good books or things like that. You're not going to get the same level of education. Um, so that's not, you know, that somebody's discriminating against you necessarily. It's just like what, what's available to you? What, what, what are those key factors in terms of your education that you're, you're getting or not getting? But there are other things too. And these stats are from the uh, Bureau of uh, Statistics. So um, in state prisons, for example, African Americans are incarcerated at a rate of 5.1 uh, times uh, more uh, than the rate of whites. As you can see, in some states it can be 10 to 1. Uh, Maryland has a prison population that's 72% black. Blacks only uh, um, make up about 13% of, of, of society, of the population in America. So these numbers, just for whatever reason, you know, just looking at them, they're obviously skewed. And so what we need to look at in terms of, you know, what, why are they why are they skewed? Um, part of it does have to do with racism. Part of it does have to do with differentiation in terms of, uh, you know, the, the number of times people uh, you know, get arrested, uh, the, the sentences, the kind of sentences, the length of sentences. Um, at one time, um, when the crack epidemic happened, when, when was that? About the, the 80s, maybe late 70s. Um, crack was was coming in uh, to the country, so it happened to, to really occur more in. Uh, you know, uh, inner city, urban areas, primarily African American. Um, cocaine has, has been around since you know, early 1900s. Uh, Coca-Cola actually used to have cocaine in it one time. Uh, you can't get that anymore. But um, uh, and so what people were seeing was that for the same weight of crack cocaine versus powder cocaine, uh, which was much more available in the white neighborhoods, the, the sentences were, were disturbingly different. They were disturbingly harsher. For, for people using crack cocaine who happen to also tend to be more primarily African American versus the same amount of weight of cocaine that was in, in white neighborhoods. So th th there was a, a, a very sharp difference there. And so, you know, uh, the criminal justice system tried to, to, to address that uh, and, and tried to, to make, um, you know, is aware of trying to make um, parity, more, more parity in terms of the kind of arrests and sentences and things like that people, uh, people have. This is a, 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 an example that really touched uh, my life. This gentleman uh, spoke here at Newman uh, back in 2016. So uh, as you can see, his name is uh, Anthony Ray Hinton. Um, Anthony Ray Hinton was arrested in Alabama in uh, 1985. He spent 30 years on death row. Um, even though there were no eyewitnesses, no fingerprints link linking him to the scene, there was no physical evidence. Um, during one of the murders, he was actually seen by his coworkers at work. 15 miles away. Uh, he even passed a polygraph test that was never admitted into evidence uh, at, at trial. Um, they claimed that he used this gun that was, that was found at his mother's house, but after ballistic testing, it was uh, determined that the bullets that were used in the crime didn't match that gun, um, and he was uh, sentenced uh, for, for this double murder. Uh, he said as he was being handcuffed and, and uh, he was cutting his mom's lawn at the time, and he said, what, what, you know, to the police officer, why are you doing this to me? And he says, you'll do. You know, we want somebody and you'll do. So he spent 30 years uh, on death row. Eventually an organization called the Equal Justice Initiative 
which is somewhat like the, um, the Innocence Project. We find the Innocence Project here in Pennsylvania and other states. They work with him for 13 years um, and going through the court system and filing appeal after appeal after appeal. Eventually, uh, it got to the U.S. Supreme Court. The, the Supreme Court ruled that he did not get a fair trial. They ordered a new trial, and the state of Alabama dropped all charges. I'm sorry, or uh, you didn't get any money for the 30 years. Uh, some states will give you money if you're exonerated or, or you know, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, he, he was not. Um, and I was saying Dr. Loomis earlier, and, and speaking with this gentleman, I, I was just really uh, amazed. Um, and I told him he reminded me of Nelson Mandela in some ways. And because he was saying, like, while he was in prison, he, you know, he tried to make the best of it. Um, sometimes he would, you know, joke with the guards and, and stuff. and, and he actually developed a pretty good relationship with some of the prison guards. And sometimes they would bring him like a McDonald's burger uh, in, in, into the prison. Um, and um, I said, well, why aren't you angry? And um, he said, what good is that going to do me? You know? He said, what I want to focus on now is being able to look up at the sky at night and see the stars. He said, I couldn't do that for 30 years. Feeling rain fall down on my face and my head. That was something I, I never experienced for 30 years. She said that really this is what I want to this is what I want to focus on, and uh, I thought it was really remarkable. DNA has been spurring, uh, no, although DNA was not used in this particular case, but has been sp spurring a lot of exonerations around the country. In fact, every year the exoneration registry goes up because of DNA evidence proving that you know people who claim that they didn't do it actually didn't do it. Uh, and even so, if you, you watch 60 Minutes, a guy you graduated from high school with, an old childhood chum. Uh, Bill Whitaker, he does a lot of the death penalty type cases, and uh, you'll see, even when somebody's clear with DNA, oftentimes the prosecutors, they're not sorry. They don't, they won't admit they made a mistake. They still think that person is guilty, even though science has proven them, them to be innocent. So, what does that say? What does that say about our system? You know, uh, what does it say about our system when science proves that you're innocent, and the people who convicted you won't accept that? And with the, the National um, Exoneration Registry, what their fear is that they say, these are only the cases that we know about. What we suspect is that there are far more. There are far more people who are, are innocent. So race can impact our, our thinking and, and our behavior in a number of ways. And this, this is an article that came out um, just uh, about maybe about two months ago. Um, and it can change our thinking. So this gentleman, Joe Bednarski, Jr., was a former KKK leader in South Jersey. But he said he was watching TV one night, and, and one of these like religious shows, uh, you know, I don't know who the minister was, or, but he said he had this religious experience. And it just changed him. It just changed him. And so uh, he became a chaplain uh, and a security guard. Uh, now he is, uh, works as both, both capacities at this black church, Bethel AME Church uh, in South Jersey. And the people in the church love him. And, and you can see this, this guy hugging him. So here was a guy who, who was just, just a hardcore racist, who, who didn't see any value in, in you know, a person of color, to somebody who, again, had this religious experience, uh, you know, who, who reevaluated his, his values and his ethics and, and believed that he was wrong at his past thinking. And is making a really positive impact, not only in his own life, but in the lives of other people as well. So issues of race, race, racism and bias, um, uh, are embedded in, in personal and family memories and, and, and experiences. Um, so when I when I give lectures, uh, oftentimes about history and, and about you know uh, these types of issues, I say this is not ancient history. It's family history. It's family history. So when something happens in your family, if you had a person in your family who who somehow survived uh, the Holocaust, the concentration camp, you're not going to forget that. That person's. Uh, in fact, scientifically that can have an impact on you two generations later because of the things that happen uh, to them. Um, so you're, you're not going to forget that. So um, as you can see, um, you know, at one time there were, there were uh, segregation was far more um, stringent and uh, uh, different uh, water fountains and um, uh, different bathrooms. Um, I live in media and oftentimes when I'm driving down State Street I'll see the, the, the trolley coming down the street. And every time I see the trolley, I think about, I remember the first time I saw a black trolley driver. I was like in my late teens or early 20s. Before that, trolley drivers were only white, only ever white. 
and and and, and that hits me. You know, that, that hits me. It's like, wow, I want to be like Charlie Driver again. You know, um, the the KKK. Um, I, I live in the house that my great grandfather bought in 1920, and shortly after he bought that house. Uh, he was living there, um, you know, my grandmom and, and uh, his wife and, and some of the grandchildren. And uh, a group of clans showed up in the backyard, about 30, 20 or 30 people. And they were looking for somebody. They happened to see um, uh, my grandfather, my great-grandfather's son-in-law, come home. And they thought that was the person they were looking for. Uh, and, and obviously it was, it was not. So my, my great-grandfather... Um, who also happened to be the, the first attorney of color in Delaware County uh, back in 1891. Um, and uh, he went out and he talked to them. And I guess he probably knew who many of them were and, and convinced them that whoever they were looking for was not in the house. And so they left. They marched down Olive Street, where I live, and uh, up on a hill. And they had a cross-burning uh, ceremony uh, up there. So this is embedded in, in my family history. This is embedded in, in, in my mind. So when issues of the KKK come up, you know, I have a personal perspective uh, about that. It's not something that, that I, I read or, or that I heard about. Um, bottom right corner, Daisy uh, Bates. Uh, this is when, um, 1957, uh, the uh, integration of Little Rock uh, High School in, in Arkansas. So you can see that's just a slim picture of what she had to go through uh, being screamed at. Uh, there's another picture that, that I swapped out for, for one of these other ones uh, about a six-year-old girl in New Orleans in 1960. Uh, she had to be escorted to school by federal marshals um, because people were very, very angry that the schools were, were being uh, integrated. Um, but it's not always just about race. It's also about ethnicity at times. So you see the, the um, uh, derogatory signs uh, about Jews uh, there and, and the concentration camps. And um, uh, the, the, the gentleman who has uh, his um, uh, serial number uh, from uh, the concentration camp tattooed uh, on his forearm. I remember seeing um, somebody with this. I was a teenager. I was making some extra money uh, doing some, uh, uh, being, being an assistant for, uh, you know, people who were doing kind of remodeling stuff. And one of the houses that I went to, this, this gentleman, you know, I saw this tattoo uh, on his arm. And uh, it made a, a very, very strong uh, impression on me. And if you ever talk to any um, American soldiers, they're, they're pretty up, up in age at this point, uh, and probably many of them from World War II have passed away, but they would tell you the impact that going into the liberating this concentration camp, what that did to them, what that did to them. Uh, they, they were never able to forget that experience. So um, my ancestors, my maternal ancestors were runaway slaves. And so oftentimes you, you hear conversations about, about race. Oh, why do we need to talk about slavery again? That happened so long ago. Well, no, it really wasn't that long ago, uh, number one. Um, the, as you see on this, this timeline, so slavery lasted, uh, you know, roughly about 200 years, and then there was uh, discrimination and, and, you know, further, uh, further discrimination. Uh, before the discovery of the Western Hemisphere, so, so going back to ancient days, a slave could be any color. Like Spartacus was, was you know, I think he was Greek or Thracian or, or something. Slavery was, was not, a, not associated with a particular color. It was only with the discovery of the New World and the advent of the, uh, the slave trade that, that slavery began to be uh, associated with particular color, you know, people of color, uh, black or, or brown or, or that sort of thing. Um, even when the, the, the Spanish, um, who were really the, the earliest, um, other than the Vikings, of course, um, settlers coming, uh, uh, colonials coming in, um, in the, in the uh, Caribbean, they didn't think that the, that the natives, uh, that the Indians had souls. Uh, you know, so it was okay to make them. It was okay to make them slaves because they weren't Christians. They didn't have souls anyway. So, um, but again, before that, a slave could be could be of any color uh, whatsoever. Um, these are my ancestors, my maternal ancestors. So, on the left, uh, Martha Jean Karen. Uh, on the right, uh, Cornelius Ridley. Um, they were slaves on neighboring plantations in Virginia. Uh, not only do I have their pictures, uh, I have stuff that belongs to them. Uh, I have uh, a cane uh, he used to use. I have this little watch stand uh, that uh, I use as kind of like a family um, uh, shrine. Um, and uh, so my grandmother told me all about that uh, because my grandmother was uh, about 22 when they, when they passed away. So, you know, she was old enough to, to hear their stories and learn about them and that sort of thing. Um, 
Cornelius, um, as you can see, he, he looks nearly white. Uh, he, uh, his father was his master. And so Cornelius had uh, red hair, green eyes, very fair skin. He looked so white that when he decided to escape from slavery, he walked 300 miles from Southampton County, Virginia, to media. And he said no one ever stopped him along the way because everyone he met assumed he was a white man. You know? So that's not typically what, what we would think about, that, that a slave looks like. African ancestry. I mean, it was just, just, just minuscule. Um, but yet their, their owners were, you know, selling them, uh, even though they could be their own children, just like any other slave. Martha Jane had a, uh, so Cornelius was a carriage driver. So he actually, you know, on, on the scale of being a slave, that was about the best possible job you could have. Because he was able to travel by himself. The average slave never traveled more than five miles from home. But because he was the carriage driver, he would get to, you know, go pick up people at the train station or, you know, uh, supplies back and forth. Um, and, um, uh, you know, that, that geographical ignorance is what really was very effective in keeping slaves from trying to, trying to run away. So he said he was actually treated quite well. Um, so, you know, I guess based on his, his looks, he probably looked like a member of the family. Um, you know, he, he said he was actually treated quite well. And, and so the, the book I, I wrote about them, Go Stand Upon the Rock, I tried to, to approach their stories as, you know, all Southerners, all white Southerners weren't bad, and all white Northerners weren't good, and that, you know, that, that people are people, and there are complexity on all levels. Um, so in Martha Jane's case, uh, my grandmother told me I was about 10 years old. She said, um, well, my grandmother was a breeding woman. And um, even at 10 years old, like, I knew what that meant, like that. That really shocked me because um, I, I knew how animals were bred. And so she said, yeah, she, she was a breeding woman. Um, so probably starting about 14 years of age. In fact, the garb that she's wearing is, is, is slave garb. Oftentimes in the South, you would have certain patterns. You know, it's almost like kind of, kind of how the Irish would have tartans or, you know, scots or that sort of thing. Um, they would have patterns so that if you were seen far away from the plantation, you were supposed to be from, someone would, would notice that immediately. So um, we don't know how many children she had. She probably started about age 14. She probably escaped around age 24. She left the South with two children, so a two-year-old and a nine-year-old uh, when she arrived up here in media. So I know that she had more children than that. But she was so traumatized by the experience, she would never discuss it. So that was a, a big body of, of information we weren't able to um, uh, re retrieve. But, but I knew a little bit more about uh, Cornelius's uh, uh, background. So this person, Isaac Yarnell. Isaac Yarnell was uh, and Elizabeth Yarnell were, were local Quakers who happened to belong to the same meeting house I belong to today. I didn't know that when I joined about 25 years ago. Just I found that out through my research. So when my ancestors escaped from slavery, um, at the time of the Civil War, there were four million slaves. 2% successfully escaped. So maybe 50,000. 50,000 sounds like a lot, but it's only 2% of 4 million. And most of the slaves who escaped uh, were male, were strong. Um, you, you had to be strong to, to make that kind of a trip, uh, especially being chased by dogs and, and, and slave catchers and that sort of thing. Uh, there was also, uh, is it warm in here? You, you can crack that window if you want a, a bit. Um, so, at the time they escaped, um, the Federal Fugitive Slave Act was still in full force. So anybody who helped the slaves, and it didn't matter if you were white or not, you could be arrested on the spot. You could be fined. You could be deputized and forced to help recapture runaway slaves. So these, these, these two local fakers, they took my ancestors in, uh, re regardless, regardless of that. Um, the woman uh, here, um, she's a descendant of those, uh, uh, of those journals who uh, took my, my ancestors in. And um, uh, back at, at this time in 2001, um, we had a ceremony at the graveyard. They got a headstone made and everything. And uh, we, we basically wrote a thank you letter from my family to hers. And all the members of my family in attendance, we gave it to her uh, to, to thank her family for what they did, which was remarkably courageous uh, in, in, in helping my ancestors. Um, <clears throat> this gentleman. So this gentleman's name is uh, Bromfield B. Nickel, and I met him on the, the internet. I never had the pleasure of meeting him in person in, in life. He is, uh, passed away uh, a 
as you can see, about four years ago. Uh, but we connected on the internet, and, and so he, um, we're both descended from the common ancestor. So that, that, that gentleman who owned my great-grandfather, my great-great-grandfather, who was also his father, uh, Colonel Thomas Ridley III, he's also his ancestor. So he and I are both descended from this, um, from this particular uh, uh, ancestor. So when I graduated from, from Penn, uh, I got my doctorate, he, he, uh, he, he sent me uh, this, this note. Sam, I can't tell you how very, very proud I am for all you've accomplished. Your credit to the Ridleys. Uh, the very best to you, the very best of luck uh, to you in your future career. Keep in touch with your cousin Brock. Um, that really touched me. That, that really touched me very deeply. In fact, I forgot to bring my, my briefcase in because I have a copy of the book with me. But I, I wrote in my book about the impact that that had on me. Because all my life, I've identified as a mixed race person. Um, but I never really recognized the white parts of my ancestors because I knew how they became my ancestors. I was always very, very angry about that my entire life. Um, but, but after his note and reading about him, he was a war hero, World War II, tank commander, bronze uh, a star, a um, uh, member of the Society of Cincinnati, which is a very distinguished military um, society uh, descended from uh, French officers and, and, and colonial officers, George Washington. Um, I d decided that I could no longer hate a clan of people I had never met. I couldn't just hate them anymore because they were white. <clears throat> because here's this guy calling me <laughs> his, his cousin. You know, he's recognized me as his kin. Uh, you know, and, and you know, we're both descended from the same slave owner, except, you know, his, his ancestors were on the white side. Mine were, you know, from this, uh, this young uh, mulatto boy. Um, but that, that made uh, an indelible impact in my life. And, and it changed me forever. I'm uh, eternally grateful to my cousin Brown. So uh, this section is a little bit part of a of another um, uh, lecture I've given uh, about uh, the civil rights uh, movement. So in regard to the civil rights movement, there there are many heroes, and you often hear, particularly in February, uh, about, about uh, you know Dr. Martin Luther King, Rosa Parks, Medgar Ever. Fannie Lou Hamer, other people, you know, like that. So in this lecture, I wasn't going to talk about that in, in this, this you know, civil rights lecture. I wanted to talk about some of the white heroes of the civil rights movement, because you never hear about them. You never hear about them. But just like those white Quakers who, who helped my ancestors escape from slavery, that would have never happened without their participation. The civil rights movement would have never happened without white people, too, working uh, along in that. But you don't often get to hear about them. I wanted to share a couple of them with you. Um, James Cheney, he's the, the gentleman at the top, African-American me uh, member. He and Andrew Goodwin and Michael Shorter, they were uh, young college students. Um, I think they were, uh, uh, Cheney was from, from Mississippi, but the other two, I think, were, were in New York. Um, they were, um, during that Freedom Summer in 1964, when, when lots of college students were going to the South, helping black people you know, to register to vote and, and uh, things like, particularly it was, it was around voting. Um, well, those three got kidnapped uh, one night. So the local police were part of the local KKK. And so they got kidnapped. Uh, they were taken out. They were murdered. Their bodies were put in the earthen dam. The FBI was called. So there was a movie made about this uh, called Mississippi Burning. Uh, and it was in part, uh, in large part, this murder, uh, these murders, led to the passage of the 1965 uh, Voter Rights Act. So... Again, you know, here were, um, and in fact, Mickey, Mickey uh, Schwerner's uh, wife insisted that he be buried next to Jane, uh, Jane Cheney uh, because she was really proud of, proud of what, what he did. Um, this is a gentleman, when I first read about him, I just had just the utmost admiration for him, James Zwerg. Uh, he was a white freedom writer from, uh, you know, Wisconsin. Uh, he was an ordained minister uh, who participated in the Freedom Rides. So in the Freedom Rides, uh, you know, uh, black and white people together would get on these uh, interstate buses and they would, you know, uh, travel around the South and stuff. It was a huge problem. So um, they were on a bus in, in Anniston, Alabama, and the bus was stopped by a mob. And um, Zwerg thought that if he got off the bus first, being a white person, that, the, you know, they, they wouldn't attack the group. They wouldn't attack uh, any of the others. As you can see, he was very much wrong. Uh, he was brutally beaten. 
Uh, he said he, he didn't know if he was alive or dead. Um, and it wasn't the first time that he had been attacked uh, for trying to fight uh, for civil rights. But very few people know about know about Mr. Mr. Gerard. This is what it looked like when they stopped the bus. They set the bus on fire to make the, the, the Freedom Riders get off. And uh, again, he was thinking, well, because I'm white, they're not going to they're not going to do anything. And, and uh, it was very, you know, unfortunately, what what happened. This is another woman I. Uh, Violet uh, Leozo. So um, she was a, a Unitarian, and um, she was down there that summer uh, driving people back and forth, uh, you know, to, to get them uh, registered uh, to vote. So uh, on her way driving back from uh, participating in the Melt March from Selma to Al, uh, Montgomery, uh, she was shot dead by the KKK. And um, adding insult to injury, uh, the FBI, under J. Edgar Hoover, he, he was um, he was a very troubled man. Um, he developed this whole um, character assassination campaign against her, and uh, said, "Oh, well, she was a drug addict, and she was a drug dealer, and she was a prostitute involved with black men." And none of that was true. Absolutely, none of that was true. Um, but uh, but people like her and people like uh, Jim's word, they put their life on the line uh, to help black people. And uh, you know, we wouldn't have some of the the major accomplishments today with the Civil Rights Act, the Voting Rights Act. If they had not stood up and, and helped, so I, I think uh, I think we need to remember them because they don't get enough uh, enough recognition. So why is this topic important? Um, I said earlier, it's not ancient history; it's family history. Uh, the issues of race, racism, and bias are deeply embedded in American society. We've never really dealt with this issue. We've never really resolved this issue, and that's part of why we have so many problems today. You know, at the end of the Civil War, um, the Confederate soldiers were allowed to take their guns home. And initially, there was um, it's called Reconstruction. So the first couple of years after the Civil War, black people had rights. Uh, you know, they were able to vote. Uh, there were record numbers of blacks being elected to office in the South. Um, there were schools that would have from grandchildren to grandparents in the school. There was this, this, this vast thirst uh, for knowledge and for learning. And you know, black people could own property, and they could serve on juries. That didn't last long, because eventually uh, the white northerners, uh, the, the abolitionists who were primarily Republicans, uh, the party of Lincoln at that time, you know, kind of lost interest, and um, the white southerners got back in power. That's when the KKK uh, formed, and this campaign of terror uh, began, and the lynchings and the beatings and the burnings, uh, that, that all started. And... In, in, in some ways, uh, you know, certainly it's not as bad as it, as it was then. But lynchings were really common, even up into the 1920s. There were at least one lynching a week uh, into the 1920s. Um, if you've ever seen a picture of a lynching, um, they're, they're pretty horrific, but they're, they're worth looking at. And, um, you know, part, part of this issue about slavery and discrimination, there are still people alive who, who remember this. You know, there's still people alive who, who remember uh, this, this type of thing. And the weird thing about some of these pictures of lynchings is it's not just the horror of seeing a person uh, hanging from a tree, but whole families would come out to watch these lynchings. And, and you'd see fathers, you know, with their, their kids on their shoulders and stuff and, and looking up and pointing and laughing. And, you know, I, I, my thinking is it's horrible enough what the person who actually put that noose around that individual's neck did. But the people who are standing there laughing, like, what does that say about them? And that's often how um, bad things happen in the world, because good, otherwise good people don't speak up. They don't disagree. Um, that's how the Holocaust happened. You know? and that was just, you know, white Jews and, and white Germans. Uh, you know, the Jews were singled out for, for problems they had nothing to do with, German society and economy. And bit by bit, they began being forced into ghettos. Their rights were taken away. away. Uh, other Germans were afraid to speak out. Uh, I mean, the Nazis were a very small group when they started, but it was it just steamrolled, and, and, and it wound up, uh, as you can see, with the, uh, with the, with the concentration uh, camp. So, um, so there is this this connection. Uh, so, what I'd like you to do is, is think about who are some of the inspiring ethical heroes uh, that you had, uh, either in your life or who have influenced you through their word, uh, through their actions. 
for me, one of them is Nelson Mandela. And, and you know, I, I mentioned him in reference to, to Mr. Hinton. Uh, when Mandela was in prison for 29 years on Robben Island, um, he um, did not act angry. He did not cause trouble. He did not act subservient. Uh, when the guards were marching him back and forth, he would not rush. He would not. He could not be pushed. He would not be hurried. He had dignity, and he walked like a, a man. And bit by bit, he won those guards over. So then, eventually, the guards were like smuggling him papers and pens and writing materials because they were just so impressed with with, with his fortitude and 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 his feelings of of self worth that it really impressed them uh, as well. Uh, so, uh, you know, I want you to think about how this discussion tonight, you know, kind of, does it make a connection for you between partnership and progress, as I said earlier, so there's not going to be any progress unless people of different ethnicities work together, um, and racial attitudes and, and social justice. Does it give you any new insights on race? Um, I'd like you to think about, when did you first notice the significant difference between whites and other people of color. Like, when did you notice maybe that you were different? Like, how did that come up? Who, who taught you that? Was, was there an incident uh, that, that happened that made you think, geez, you know, I'm, I'm different, or I'm treated different than, than, than other people uh, may, may, may be? And what can you learn uh, to help or to mitigate this problem? Uh, because, as I said, the, the, the issue of Maybe this problem doesn't affect me. Maybe it doesn't today, but I bet it affects someone you know. And I bet it eventually is going to affect you or your family or your friends or, or whatever. Uh, the issue of uh, undocumented uh, immigrants in our country today. You know, some people, uh, you know, feel very strong. Oh, you know, yeah, get them all out of the country, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Well, um, immigration has, illegal immigration has gone down over the past decade. Obama uh, deported more undocumented uh, immigrants than George Bush did. Um, the U.S. Uh, Chamber of Commerce um, and, and others uh, look at, you know, study these the statistics, and if all 12 million, and they're primarily Mexicans, but they're from other areas, if all 12 million Mexicans were deported, the economies of the four southwestern states would crash. Uh, right now, California is having a huge problem because crops in the fields are rotting because there's no one to pick them. Uh, I had the opportunity to, to visit a migrant camp um, almost 10 years ago. I was a member of um, Sisters of St. Francis Diversity Committee. And on the committee was uh, a gentleman who himself had been an undocumented uh, immigrant and um, uh, one of the, one of the uh, sisters. Uh, so I was, happened to be in Portland, Oregon. I went up to Seattle to see them. They drove me up to this migrant camp about 40 miles from the Canadian border. And um, it, 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 it stunned me because I didn't think we were in America anymore. I didn't think we were in the United States. I thought we were someplace else. Um, the housing that these people were living in. Uh, anybody know what a Quantic hut is? I think John Walker knows what, what that is. But, uh, you know, old military style barracks, um, you know, they, they had this kind of rounded roof and, and uh, they were cheap and uh, easy to make and, and put up. Well, these people are living in these constant huts. And the problem, some of the problems were that um, when condensation would form on the roof, uh, it would like rain in their house. Uh, and um, the house that we went in, which was one of the better ones, um, the, uh, the family had a Bunsen burner they were using uh, to cook their, their meals. Uh, the gentleman had um, gotten all these carpet samples, you know, these square patches of carpet and duct taped them all together so they had kind of kind of a carpet. Uh, there was no outdoor lighting. Um, and um, there was a common latrine area. Uh, again, no, no lights. Um, one of the little girls was talking to uh, the, the gentleman um, I was with and they were speaking Spanish and she was saying, uh, you know, I'm afraid sometimes to go to the bathroom at night. I have to wake up my mother because I'm afraid to, to walk out there in the dark um, to, to go to um, uh, this, this uh, the latrine. Um, and these kids only get a few months of education a year because they're moved. You know, depending on, you know, strawberries are in season over here. Okay, we'll pick them. When they're all picked out, we'll go do the blueberries. Well, this, this, this beautiful little gang of kids. And then this one little girl was just absolutely gorgeous. She spoke better English than the kids on my block. 
with about three months a year of education. And, and, I, and I kept thinking, is she going to be a, an astronaut someday? Is she going to be a scientist? Is she going to be a doctor? You know, what what could what could these people, what could these children who are so hungry for knowledge, like what could they accomplish if if, if they had not a handout, but 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 a way to to, to, to get proper schooling uh, and and make it uh, in America? Um, so you you see a lot of the things that are happening uh, in this. I mean, anti-Semitism, uh, and for a while there, there were a number of cemeteries that were being vandalized, and uh, I think a couple of synagogues were burned, and, and it's interesting because you would see that um, in places where it happened, people from the Muslim community would immediately go to their support, and would immediately help them, would immediately raise fun funds to help repair the synagogues. And you saw the same thing happening in reverse in, in, other, in other areas, particularly in, in, in France, when, when, when a uh, a Muslim um, mosque would, would, would get burned down. Jewish people would make a ring around that property to keep anybody from doing any further damage to it. Because I think, you know, many people understand that, um, as Martin Luther King said, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. So maybe they're not coming after you today. And there's a famous poem about the, the Holocaust in World War II. This guy says, uh, well, you know, first they came for you know the trade unionists, but I wasn't a trade unionist. So, and then they came for this other group, but I, you know, I wasn't one of them. And then they came for this, and eventually they came for me. And, and so, so that that that's how it works. Uh, so I, I think it's it's incredibly important to us, um, for us more than ever, that people from different backgrounds, different ethnicities, um, that we try to find common ground. We're not going to agree on everything, but we try to find common ground. We try to remember that we really are all members of one human family. And if we hope to, to make it into the next millennium, the way that we're going to do that is by cooperating and collaborating. And, um, you know, um, you know that, that's not, you know, not, not to say that, um, uh, you know, in, in, in any society, in any group, there are going to be good people and maybe not so good people. But by and large, statistics will show you that undocumented immigrants commit far fewer crimes than native-born Americans. They have a higher uh, level of education. They actually create more businesses, which generate more money for their local communities and, and, and create more jobs so that they can hire Americans. Um, and, and so, you know, um, I think we need to look beyond the skin color, look beyond the headlines, look beyond uh, the stuff. Um, uh, you know, I know that there is a threat of, of uh, terrorism, there, there's the, the site of anti um, Semitism, there's a lot of anti-Muslim uh, uh, feeling in the country. Muslims have been around before there was the United States of America. George Washington loved his Muslim soldiers because they were so devoted to him and so dedicated. Muslim soldiers fought in the Civil War. You know, American Indian soldiers fought in every war. You know, the code talkers in World War One and World War Two, they helped win the war. So, you know, we, 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 have to, we have to look beyond the differences. Um, I, I had to, in just closing, I had the opportunity to, um, a couple of months ago, I attended a, uh, an interfaith uh, program at a mosque in, uh, in Westchester. And um, there was a, 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 you know, a young uh, college professor there, and he was talking about, you know, uh, uh, Islam and, and different parts of history and about the, the Quran and things like that. And um, I was shocked at... And I should have known this because I, I took a course in comparative religions many years ago. How much similarity, how much in common um, Christianity, um, Judaism, and Islam have in common? And he was talking about, well, you know, in, 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 uh, in the Quran, um, the person mentioned most in the Quran is Mary, mother of Jesus. Like they view her as a kind of a saint. They view her as, uh, they, they view Jesus as one of the prophets. Nobody is mentioned in the Quran, not even Muhammad, is mentioned more than Mary, you know, the mother of Jesus. And, and, you know, they say, well, you know, we all have a common ancestor, Abraham, you know. Uh, so, you know, Abraham is recognized by all, all three religions. So, um, so again, I, I think that it really behooves us to um, learn and grow. And part of going to college is to test your ideas, is to learn about different things, is to 
look at things from other people's point of view. Because what we believe to be true, maybe that's not true. Or maybe it's only partly true. Maybe there's, there's much more uh, common uh, we, we, that we have in common. And uh, whether that's ethnicity, you know, whether that's uh, physical abilities, whether that's uh, you know, uh, poverty, whether that's, uh, you know, wh whatever that is. Um, but um, I, I think, uh, you know, I think part of the, the rent that we're supposed to pay for being here on this planet is to help people. You know, not, not, not to hurt them. Um, the Dalai Lama said, you know, if you can't help people, at least don't hurt them. So, um, Okay, well let's 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 stop here and um, <laughs> thank you, thank you. So, uh, you want to chat for a minute or you want to take a break? What, what, what's what's your druthers? Well, since we have a little time, why don't, why don't Dr. DePaul, why don't you, uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Lemus, why don't you? Uh, yes. There, there's a few more slides. Further back? Okay. on this one. When did you first notice some significant social differences between whites and people of color? I grew up in the Italian neighborhood. And uh, blacks were avoided our neighborhood. They would avoid them. If they, they were to come in our neighborhood, it would be they'd get beat up. anything, you would have to say anything. Years, uh, I was working with a, a co-director of mine, and, and he grew up in the neighboring part, and he asked me one day, where did you live? Where did you grow up? I told him, you know, and he said, whoa. And he said, what do you mean by that? He said, my mother would teach us how to bypass your neighborhood, what streets you would have to go down. Wasn't an acceptable color of the skin. Um, and as I sat there listening to, to Sam, I'm saying to myself, where did it become more obvious to me to say that's wrong? That that wasn't right. And I keep saying that. I keep saying that. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, what am I doing? Back of the mic. You can't move? That's going to be hard. Hi, John. <laughs> um, but I'll just, I'll just give you my own little story, and maybe just as a, to generate some, some of your own thoughts. Um, the book that we'll talk about much more after our break really woke me up. It's good that it woke me up. <laughs> uh, and I say this with a, a little bit of a mea culpa. Um, it was painful for me to read that. It 
because I'm part of it. And there's a page in there, I think it's around page 32 by a gentleman named Christoph, who says, even good people don't even realize how they participate in this issue of entitlement and racism and how we just participate in it unknowingly. Unbeknownst to us, stuff that becomes common. And as I read this, one of it, as you go on and on, and said, you know, geography, you know, where do you live, and how do you live, and who lives around you. And then I read the line by Martin Luther King Jr., when he said, uh, the most segregated hour of the week is 11 o'clock. That one almost brought me to my knees. Because I knew exactly what he meant. Painfully, I knew exactly what he meant. So there, as, I mean, I don't know how long it took you to read this. It, I said to Dr. Lemon, I know we've had various books that required reading throughout the program. This one, was the most powerful in my estimation that will not end at the end of this course. The other ones after the test were done. You know, but, but this one, this will remain with me, this particular book. And I have to ask myself why. I have to ask myself why. You know, I, I like to think that I was on a positive side of a ledger of acceptance. And I think I was duping myself a little bit. You know, because racism is not a black issue. It isn't. It's not about blacks. It's about humans. It's about us. Here's what I mean about the simplicity of my complicity. A student of mine, a year ago in my undergrad program, we were talking about racism. We, were, we had just viewed the movie, Remember the Titans. So we were talking about racism. And I said, how do you feel about it and everything? And a, and a student, an African-American student, stood up and said, Dr. DePaul, I get bothered when people treat me differently because I'm darker than them. This was last year, and the way Darian referenced that statement was an eye-opener for me. I get offended that people treat me differently because I am darker than them. And I was conveying that story to somebody and said, yeah. You know, he was saying that he's darker than us. And the person said to me, what makes you the barometer? Why are you the barometer? He's darker than you. What if you're lighter than him? I think that's what this book is about. That subtle but blatant for me to say, yeah, he was talking about that he's darker than us. And the person, good friend of mine, very good friend of mine, and only good friends could talk that way. What if, what if you're lighter than him? That's the perspective piece that I think Sam was, was sharing with us a little bit. That you know, I. I when he talked about that piece, it was very, that's the piece that keeps haunting me, my perspective of this, of this, of our lives. This isn't, quote unquote, an issue. This is a life experience. You know, and when we're talking about this program of, of ethics and social responsibility, 
There's no way that we could talk about our role in the area of bringing about a social responsible culture society without talking about this and acknowledging this by neighborhoods, by schools, by families, by, by churches. And, and at the young old age of where I'm at now, the question of why has been impacting upon me for the last two years more than ever. It's always been there. But for some reason, it haunts me now. It, 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 has, taken, it has taken a, a, a grasp of, of my soul because what the heck have we been doing in sin? And, and you know, and not to be able, and, and to just recognize it right now isn't enough. It takes action. It takes participation. It takes involvement. You know, it takes listening to a, a session like Sam just shared with us. I mean, if this were if this were down at your library, a block or two from your house, talk on racism tonight. I'm not going to ask you. This is rhetorical. How many are going? I'm not. That Johnny's gone? I probably wouldn't. After reading the book, yeah. Well, see, again, I take a mea culpa. If I didn't have to read this book, I wouldn't have. I knew this book was out there. I read Jim Wallace's stuff. If I didn't have to read this book, I would not have read this book. That's what I'm talking about. That's what I'm talking about. That it has to be ingrained as part of a required reading in a text that in a course. Why? And why have I yet to find anybody who has read this book? I mean, and I, I like to think that my friends are on the progressive side, the liberal side, the open-minded, and I said, has anybody read the book? Not now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> has anybody read the book America's Original Sin? I have yet to find the person who has read this book. Anybody? Did it mean other than us? You, you found somebody? <laughs> but there's a there's a whole lot of this that just you know I mean Sam started out this this wonderful presentation this laying the groundwork <coughs> with a simple piece saying this is a difficult topic to talk about and I just sat there and said why what makes this difficult. What makes this topic difficult to talk about? I'm taking that off the rhetorical and making it an open question. Why is this a difficult topic to talk about? Is it a difficult topic to talk about? Do we have a difficult time talking about this topic? Why is it a difficult topic to talk about? Let me, let me, I only have a couple more weeks here, so I'm going to drill down. One more. Like, what's the wrong thing? African American instead of black, black instead of African American, what are we this month?
the right way, the way it was programmed, the way it had been programmed. of the 
girls who was in the high school that came back, they were going to be one of the speakers, says to the class, girls, when you go to this school, you're going to be sitting with different people. And then she said, honest to God, I found myself eating at tables with Italians. I was like standing behind her. I said, whoa. I found myself eating at tables with Italians. Okay. That's a different feeling. That's a different feeling. Okay. And
need to pay reparations. It was to upset people and then show them that they had no idea what they were talking about. And uh, it was incredible. And I think that that's what we struggle with discussing race. We have these impassioned arguments that are just, they're just our experience and it's a very limited lens. You're, you're missing a lot of it. And uh, we're so sure we're right that we don't really want to know. I know I talk too long when people have actually shifted and there's cameras involved. <laughs> <laughs> there was not when I started. If you missed the first part of your wonderful words, <laughs> no, no, I'm good. Particularly if they can see me, now I'm uncomfortable. Oh, yeah. no, they can only hear you. Very clever on them. One more slide. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, I have a My first um, significant thing, um, I grew up in the inner city, Strawberry and Mansion, Kentucky, in North Philadelphia, and it was literally four square blocks. All African American, that's all we knew. Teachers were white, and our police officers were white. That was it. That was the only other race we saw. And I went into inner city, I went to all inner city schools, all African Americans. I went to college, and while a lot of my peers decided to go to um, historically black universities, I didn't want to go there. Because all I saw was black people all my life. Um, I was fortunate enough to go to Drexel University. And the very first class I took at Drexel University, it was just me. And it as an African American in the class. And it's difficult because even today as you rise in success, you still find it's just you. I look around the class, it's just me. In my management meetings, it's just me. So the difficulty in having a conversation is I have a lot of passion in what I face. They can't get my story. They can't understand my story. So I can have this conversation with my family, with my husband, with my peers I grew up with, because we all have the same perspective. But I can I can have the conversation in my management meeting or in my classroom, but they don't have the same perspective that I have. So that's what makes the conversation difficult. And it was it's funny because recently I was um, going to a meeting in, in Jersey with a few people from our management team and I rode in a car with um, my director. And my director is a, a white woman and it was myself and it was another manager who's um, Hispanic. And they started talking about Colin Kaepernick. And they had their opinions on Colin Kaepernick, Colin Kaepernick and, and I, and you know, why people weren't standing for the national anthem. And so I let them talk. And I said, it's bigger than that. It's not the song. It's not the national anthem. It's so much bigger than that. And I, I gave my opinion on it. And while we had a genuine conversation in that car, when we left out of that car, I still walked away feeling they don't get it. And it doesn't anger me that we can't openly have conversations. It frustrates me that for a lot of it, it they come into the community and they volunteer. We do a lot of volunteer work at, at where I work. We go into Camden. We go into these communities. We leave. So 
while you see the hungry children when we go to the shelters and you know while while we see the happy families when we're giving them clothing we go home you know and then we discuss it at work and everyone had their opinion and their view on how it touched them i lived it as a child i was the one getting knocked a knock on the door and receiving those things so even my perspective on, on that is different. I now see it from the point of giving, but I also lived it from the point of receiving. So I don't feel like those conversations can ever be genuine because we don't same, share the same views. I mean, I think they can be had. I think they can be discussed. But if people don't see things the way you see it or live the way you live it, my husband is much older than I am, so he grew up in segregation. He grew up in an area um, where, you know, it was it was white, and and he got picked on a lot, and so he tells me his story, and I couldn't relate because I only grew up in a black neighborhood. It was May of 2011 that I was called the N word for the first time in my life, and it took me to my core. And when I had the discussion with my husband about it after the situation happened, it was a traffic incident and we were both in traffic and and someone called me to Edward for the first time in my life in 2011. And I had the discussion with my husband and he felt he felt for me, but he lived it. So he just was like, that it happened. It never happened to me until May 2011. So when you say, you know, unfortunate enough, I was able to become successful to move out of the inner city and raise my children outside of the inner city and have them see and live among other cultures. But I still go back there. My family's still there. And it really hurts me because now I get to go home. I leave. And they are not they as in my family, but the people I grew up with. They're still there. And now I'm the one who leaves. So it's it's different it's very difficult from many different perspectives for me. 